Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending from where you're tuning in today. We're super happy to have our second, or not Instagram, LinkedIn Live today focused on marine pollution and waste management in small island developing states. And yeah, some of you might already know the format. We try to bring people together from the industry itself because we believe we should talk with each other and not about each other. This time, it's more from the waste management side. Last time, we had a lot of people from the packaging side on. In the future, obviously, it would be great to have one um, yeah, forum where we can really then talk with each other. But for now, it's all about explaining the challenges of um, yeah, the different sectors and get a bit more understanding of where things are going on each side. Um, and yeah, again, very prominent lineup today. I want to... Um, or I don't want to take too much of the time away and let everybody introduce themselves real quick. And maybe we just quickly start with um, Paolo. Sure. Thank you, Joel. Thank you for the opportunity of being here. So my name is Paolo and um, I represent uh, Adelphi. That is a think tank based in Berlin, working on a different topic around sustainability. And me and my team work on the circular economy team mostly around plastics, uh, e-waste, and textile. And personally, I focus very much on, um, on uh, plastic waste, working in the majority of the projects are in developing countries um, for projects founded both by the private sector, but also for the international organization. And uh, we work towards uh, the creation of a policy framework around the plastic waste management, but also in um, assessing the dimension of the of the plastic problem, conducting material flow analysis, another type of study that allow us afterwards to um, to take a, to try to tackle the problem from the correct angle. In one of this project that I'm um, currently developing and working together with Afra, especially in the Maldives, but I leave Afra introduce themselves and then we can go more organic into the conversation later. Yeah, I would say um, maybe we continue quickly with uh, JB because then when Afra introduces himself, we can dive right into uh, the, the real life situation from the Maldives because I think the, the interesting thing, especially in this forum is who, whoever I speak to and when I hear where you're all located sometimes also during the projects, one might always think like, ah, these are beautiful locations and then you receive the images of how it looks behind the scenes and you think like, well, there's a lot of work to do, um, and yeah, let's hear it from JB what you're working on and how you're helping. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Joel, uh, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so I'm JB, uh, representing uh, Nomad Plastic and Plastic Odyssey. So basically, I work on plastic waste management solutions. I've done a bit of research, uh, published a uh, thesis on the topic, focusing a lot on uh, small scale, some industrial scale. Um, solutions for plastic recycling. So really from upcycling, down cycling and uh, the classic recycling and uh, reverse logistics. Um, uh, so with uh, so Nova Plastic, we have based in Hong Kong, but we operate in Indonesia. We have a, a social business that is uh, connecting uh, ecotourism and plastic waste management, basically by transforming the plastic that we collect in these uh, remote coastal areas and islands into fuel for the um, tourism operations. Uh, so this is one way to tackle the problem in this uh, location with this business model. On the other side, uh, representing Plastic Odyssey, uh, who, which is a international network of recyclers and developing low tech solutions for plastic recycling. Uh, and basically we are developing uh, projects uh, for now in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, with, uh, I mean, supporting entrepreneurs to scale up their operations to reach a more significant level of capacity of production and also reaching a more viable uh, business model uh, for their operations. So that's uh, the quick overview and we'll dig deeper uh, later, I'm sure. Yeah, perfect. Thanks a lot for the intro. Now let's send over to Afra. 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Afra. Uh, I represent uh, Zero Waste Maldives. Zero Waste Maldives is an NGO working primarily on waste management issues and climate change in the Maldives. And uh, when you hear about Maldives, you'll always hear about uh, environmental issues as well as uh, climate change related impact. Rarely, rarely do you hear about waste management issues in the Maldives. Um, as an NGO, we work primarily on trying to get Maldives on a circular economy track for, for pretty much all the years that We've been around like we've been on a lean economy track and our mindset is sort of fixed in that regard so our main uh, objective with the ngo is really to try and get uh, the government to shift its policies uh, to be more circular in their thinking as well as their implementation so that is mainly our primary objective as well and our focus is also on trying to get um, policy level interventions in place for reduction as well because there needs to be a lot more work done on reducing the waste that we generate in order to try and manage it in the end so those those are the key objectives and the sort of directions that we are working on we uh, we work very closely with the un agencies in the maldives as well as uh, abroad and uh, we also work uh, a lot with the island councils that um, that are based um, further away from the capital but have less access to resources but more access to willpower and actual you know uh, ability to try and make a difference so we work closely with those kind of uh, island councils to try and make a difference as well uh, um, very very interesting and i think the perfect or the maldives are a perfect case for um yeah, for our conversation here today. And I'd be very interested. I think the, the, the global narrative is very similar everywhere. I think it's very, very obvious that we need to reduce the waste production in the first place so we can take a bit of pressure off the systems that need to handle those. Um, the second thing is the overall topic of the circular economy. Right? It's like there's this global trend that is, that is going on. And Somehow it feels that no matter where you go, we are kind of failing at it. Uh, if you look at the German waste management system, it's like a lot of material also still goes into incineration. And I think this is the same thing all over um, the world. But this is a different challenge, I believe, compared to, to what the Maldives are facing. So maybe you can fill us in a bit about your reality. and What are the challenges that you see in the Maldives to transition to, to a more circular economy? Um, sort of giving uh, some of our viewers sort of like a geographic context of uh, the Maldives. The Maldives is comprised of about uh, 1,192 islands. And of that around uh, 180 islands are inhabited islands with uh, localities like uh, island council sort of operating and like having the jurisdiction of uh, sort of that uh, government management of the islands. Uh, and we also have... Um, I don't really ex know exactly how much the numbers is, but these numbers keep growing expon exponentially. Like we do have over 200 resorts as well now. So some are under construction, some are already operational. So close to 200 to 50 uh, resorts uh, are in operation in the Maldives. And uh, obviously all these islands are sort of uh, uh, scattered all over the map in, in a five, 500 kilometer sort of uh, distance. So uh, the waste management challenge is huge, like uh, es especially when it comes to logistics and also trying to set up infrastructure individually on these individual islands. We're talking about maybe at least 400 uh, individual waste management uh, facilities at least to be built on these islands. And uh, from the beginning, like when, when waste management was trying to was getting set up in the Maldives, we, we've thought about it as an uh, individual sort of um, effort like each island works together uh, works uh, on its own to manage its waste and try to figure it out on their own and so uh, the waste management policy has been to always build sort of like a small waste management facility on the island and then try to get them to aggregate the waste on on onto that uh, particular facility so you'd have mainly just collection and then just aggregation in this particular area so there was little uh, management happening because uh, usually uh, uh, before plastics and these kind of uh, non-degradable uh, items started um, becoming uh, taking center stage in our like lives, um, it used to get buried, it used to get burned, and um, a lot of them got composted. But now we can't really uh, like 
since the whole waste stream is contaminated with these uh, other items and we don't really segregate at the household level, uh, burning waste has become sort of like the main uh, waste management, so to speak, sort of uh, solution that, that's uh, being implemented. Uh, but uh, we're seeing a shift now. So in the Maldives also, a lot of the islands are doing uh, segregation, at least trying to do segregation. And the government is also pushing towards uh, mandating segregation in the islands so that they can uh, better manage those waste streams. And then eventually as a next stepping step, uh, stepping stone, bringing sort of that recycling uh, elements like maybe trying to uh, bail them and then ship them over to recycling facilities and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. But the problem is at the moment, uh, the Maldives doesn't have these kind of facilities as well. So we have to figure out sort of logistics to try to bring it to the capital, consolidate it, then ship it overseas. So that mm -hmm. is sort of like the general, you know, uh, waste management situation that's happening in the Maldives. And I'm sure, uh, I mean, other SIDS countries would have similar challenges and similar, I mean, difficulties that they are facing as well. Now, now what, what I always find interesting is in the end, um, you know, we speak about the consumer packaged goods industry. So we manage to somehow ship a consumable somewhere. It has a value. People consume it, but the packaging itself obviously doesn't really have value. Um, which means that the waste management sector in this specific area basically needs to create enough value around the waste that they can either pay for the logistics or um, use it in the island itself, right? But the, the actual logistic costs and all that is so high that it, um, it's just super difficult to, to ship it from A to B. And um, I'd be, be curious to hear from, from Paolo and from, from JB as well, who have been in this or in, in other areas to, to cross compare a bit, how, how does the situation compare to what you see in the Maldives? Yes, I think that the, in, just because I working with AFRA on an um, extended producer uh, responsibility project in the Maldives, I can uh, underline what is said. Basically, the logistics behind the shipment of the material across the islands has an enormous cost. We, a few months back, we um, did on behalf of NDP a, a sort of a feasibility study on the um, on the shipment of the plastic across the island, and we noticed that it's basically more expensive to shift material from the southern islands of the Maldives to Male than to ship from Male to other countries in the in South Asia. Um, then, as and also as a um, an important point that Afra touched before is that in many SIDS countries, there is the lack of a, um, demand of a certain uh, plastic products because the recycling infrastructure are not present there. So um, something that um, is pretty interesting and that I found for the, when I went to the Maldives for the first time is that the totally absence of uh, an informal sector there. So in other countries in Southeast Asia, like Thailand, Indonesia, the informal sector is kind of the backbone of the entire waste collection of uh, recyclables because there is a continuous demand of that material and they can put on market very easily. While in countries like the Maldives, this is not present. So there is not a request at all. And for me, it was very strange after a lot of years working in country in Southeast Asia to go to the Maldives and see PT bottles everywhere. So I said, Guys, there is a huge value between this uh, behind uh, this material, but no one is asking for them. Therefore, no one has the interest of uh, of collecting them, and um, and this is something that really made me think that uh, yeah, uh, other type of solution needs to be implemented. And uh, we are now working together on this extended producer responsibility scheme in the Maldives when we are trying to shift the responsibility of the waste management towards the producers or the importers of the goods because the uh, Maldives also relies a lot on imports. So the majority of the plastic entry the countries is important from abroad. And uh, so the idea of the DPR scheme that we, we are currently developing is to shift the responsibility towards these players, making them uh, responsible of the, partially of the entire collection of plastic across uh, the atolls. And so this is one of the outcomes from the Maldives. If I can just bounce it with another experience that I did a few days ago, I returned on last weekend from the Dominican Republic. 
I didn't know that Dominion Republic was a seeds country. It's a quite big compare with the, with the Maldives, for example, but uh, it's considered as a seeds country. And also there, despite there is um, a, a recycling plastic market, the, the demand of the PT recycling, of, of PT bottles, sorry, is not there because the recycling system uh, focuses only on certain materials such as HDP and PP. So also there, you go on the on some uh, beaches in Santo Domingo or in Punta Cana, and you see just PT bottles everywhere. And this, as I said before, uh, kind of shock for me seeing the high value that there is behind that material and also behind that type of plastics. No. Um, there's some of my outcomes. So maybe JB as a. I would be happy to jump in uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, with a few experiences on my side. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe taking the case of, uh, and it's super interesting to see yeah, the, the specific context of the remoteness of those locations really has an impact on the market traction and the incentive that you can find and defining a bit uh, like what's the waste management is going to be like and what are the possibilities. So really looking at this um, criteria is super important to then have define a strategy. Um, Indonesia, yeah, if we give a few numbers as well, because it's interesting for the Maldives to see a bit how it's uh, distributed in terms of islands. And uh, so Indonesia, I mean, much bigger, but over 17,000 islands uh, and 6,000 are uh, inhabited. And um, yeah, what you can see is uh, tons of, I mean, it's really um, broke down into uh, like super remote areas as well. And you can find uh, like big hubs like Surabaya when you, you you have to basically ship your valuables. But for some of those areas uh, uh, far east in Indonesia, you will have to ship everything like from uh, those areas like uh, in Sorong or Flores where uh, our project Nomad Plastic is based. Uh, the huge cost of uh, this reverse logistics and sending back uh, is, is a big issue, especially if you don't have enough uh, feedstock and volumes to to justify such activities. Uh, but still, the informal sector is there, but remains a huge part of those, uh, of the plastic, which are all these sachet and multi layers, et cetera, uh, with no real market traction uh, because no one is buying there, uh, because no one is transforming it uh, either. Um, and this is where we can a bit bring additional solutions because there were a lot of solutions that were accessible at the industrial level, which means you need to have massive uh, volumes. And when you talk about like small communities uh, in remote areas, uh, you need to find a way to bridge this gap. Uh, so where uh, Plastic ODC uh, jumped in with like low tech solutions was to kind of decentralize and make it accessible to have technologies to also transform waste at the more local level. Uh, so we're not talking about uh, a few bottles uh, a day, but trying to make something like a social business that will have uh, potential for a viable activity. And uh, yeah, cutting the cost on uh, all the transportation and trying to make value out there. So of course, uh, what you need is uh, a market for the product that you make. So if you go for, uh, I mean, in those islands, the, the characteristic that is super interesting is um uh, the high value of the energy so of course it's tempting to say okay i'm going to transform my low value waste into energy if you have the proper uh equipment so we, we can talk about the solutions like paralysis later on but uh, you also have uh, solutions uh, for uh waste to products like some kind of upcycling when you you can also make some eco bars or construction materials but same you need to have a market for it and that your product is actually competitive to traditional alternatives. And of course, I think we're going to dig deeper into plastic credits and the way to offset to find the, let's say, least worse alternative to uh, having the uh, plastic ending up in the ocean, which is to give maybe artificial value or try to find uh, yeah, a producer responsibility here to uh, uh, slowly shift to a more viable uh, system for these plastics. And then another way, which is a bit uh, less address is to try to find some business models that integrate a bit more the ecosystems. So with, uh, yeah, Nomad Plastic here, we try to connect this waste problem with uh, ecotourism and trying to have uh, like 
tourists visiting these places to make them pristine as they were before by contributing through their participation into the waste mm -hmm. management uh, system. So yeah. those are just a few uh, topics that I just launched out there, and then maybe we can yeah. uh, get back to it. But this is for uh, yeah. quick experience. It's uh, super interesting, and um, to me, the the interesting common denominator is a bit, um, or to make it a bit more tangible, maybe just because there would be precious metals on a, on an asteroid somewhere in, in the universe, we still wouldn't send a rocket there if it if the trip there would be more costly than the the raw material that we can extract. Right, and this is the same thing that we basically see with the island states just because a water bottle might have a value on the recycling market, the logistics to go get it back are higher than the actual material value, we won't do the activity. And this basically translates into all the solutions that, that we hear in, in this round is, how can we give waste value um, so that it is ideally consumed locally, ideally in a circular economy, um, but also what do we do if, if these things fail, right? So a lot of the solutions that were proposed is, okay, we have a market for certain materials on a specific island, so we can use it there, we can produce something, the material will flow there, but a lot of the waste just has no value. And um, this is where topics like EPR and um, plastic credits come in, right? Or other technologies that allow you, for example, to produce fuel for the, the tourism operations, um, where you even have a bit of a story value around it that just bumps it up high enough that the economics of the entire industry makes sense. Um, and yeah, I think it would be really interesting to, to shine a bit more light on how you think about EPR and what's what's going to be important for such systems to come into place, for example, in, in the Maldives. Um, Should I go? So, um, okay. Yeah, um, either, either you or, or Afra. I can start, then uh, Afra JB can just jump into the conversation. Um, so, for who is not familiar with EPR, EPR uh, means Extended Producer Responsibility, that is a, a, a policy um, framework that basically it want to shift the responsibility of the waste, uh, of the products once they become waste, towards the producers um, or those players that put that material on the market. This is a kind of a, a policy that has been uh, applied and uh, is quite solid here in Europe uh, since decades. Uh, while in, um, in many countries, so there are a lot of governments that want to start to apply this, um, um, this type of policy, making sometimes a copy paste of them, but having reality in terms of waste management, they are totally different from what is, uh, uh, for example, in Europe. In Europe, Germany doesn't have uh, uh, 200,000 islands, for example. So the logistic here is way easier than what is um, there was in, in Indonesia or in the Maldives. So what we are, what we are working together with the Zero Waste Maldives um, there in the Maldives is a, um, a project founded by UNDP uh, by the Ocean Innovation Challenge. And we are trying to develop a EPR framework uh, or a policy framework towards the uh, establishment of this uh, EPR policy. So um, ideally, so um, the, the funds the, the found that are collected by the producer from the producers should be used for the entire waste management. So from the collection and then the transport and the, uh, the final disposal, for example, or recycling. In the Maldives, we have seen, as also Afra has anticipated before, there are a huge challenges, there are huge costs behind a certain type of uh, operations. For example, the collection within the islands is, could be relatively cheap, considered to other countries, while the transport of the material between an island to a, a collection point can be very high. So we are now trying to understand, first of all, the size of the Maldivian market in terms of plastic. And uh, we are here also facing an issue that I think is common to many other six countries. So there is no clarity behind the amount of plastic or better, the amount of plastic weight that's generated in a country. This because uh, there is no kind of linearity uh, from the governments in asking 
um, to the importer, to the producer, to declare what they put on market. And once we can know this, we can, we, are, we, can all, we can directly know the size of the problems and then address this through the uh, correct policy regulations. Mm, this is what we are doing now. So we are basically trying to uh, work with the Ministry of Environment there in uh, drafting together a strategy for uh, EPR uh, that should cover all packaging, plastic packaging material. And um, yeah, so Afra, if you want to, if, if I've forgotten anything, feel free to, to jump in. I think you've touched on pretty much everything that we are up to. I mean, in a nutshell, uh, but I wanted to just uh, talk about some of the informal sector, like the, some of the history of the informal sector in the Maldives, since that might be a bit interesting. So before um, we created sort of a waste management company in the Maldives to sort of uh, carry out the waste collection uh, activities in the capital, there used to be an informal sector. So uh, this, these were mainly uh, expatriate workers that were uh, brought into the Maldives to do sort of labor labor type work. And they used to do uh, waste, waste uh, collection from the households as sort of like an additional income stream that they could generate. So uh, this was very organized, like in terms of like the collection, like if, if like say one of the collection guys was sick, then somebody will would fill in. And even if it rained, like they would show up and pick up, pick up your waste. So like it was very well organized, but then the government uh, felt like uh, there were a lot of gaps because there were some obviously that uh, did not actually take the waste to the intended spot and then they would just dispose it anywhere that they they thought it would not get caught i mean where they would not get caught so this became a burden to them and also the, the government sort of uh, saw an opportunity to sort of monopolize the sector because obviously waste is also a lot of money and they saw a lot of money being uh, shipped out of the country through the expatriate workers that would remit the uh, money back to their families back home. So the government decided to create sort of this uh, waste management company called uh, Vamco, waste management company. Uh, so they, um, uh, after that company was created, uh, they, they sort of outlawed uh, the collection. So these uh, expatriate workers, they used to collect on bikes. So this was basically, I mean, a zero emission waste collection effort that was happening. And then this got replaced by uh, waste management trucks like compactors and stuff. And then now that is sort of like the waste management system we have in the capital. And then that got replaced by the informal sector. But we do have very few uh, waste pickers that might try and take out um, uh, some high value recyclables, like maybe some glass bottles that can be resold, some metal, aluminum, these kind of and scrap. Uh, like electronics that could be repaired and stuff, they they buy and uh, resell them on a resale market. But I mean, in comparison to what it was, it's very small now. Yeah, I think you you highlighted two very interesting points. It's like a that certain materials just dump anywhere because it has no value. Nobody wants to have it, so you always look for the cheapest way of disposal. And in the end, it's often just the rivers or the ocean itself, right? At least it's gone, or you you burn it under the open sky. Um, what I, I'd be curious about, because JB, it sounds like you found a system to create or economies on the island states itself. Are these self-sufficient, or do you think that um, EPR schemes or plastic credits or anything help you in your pursuit? Yeah. Um, so for the for the case of uh, these small islands with high costs of, uh, of energy and this remoteness uh, preventing this reverse logistics. It's pretty much a business case for, for pyrolysis, uh, which is pretty much the like best alternative you can find for these low value plastics. Um, and uh, at least it's, it's one of the options. And uh, basically by definition, so the fuel is expensive. So it's a direct alternative It's massively used by uh, all the uh, fishermen communities uh, for all transportation. And so with this, you can uh, produce uh, so diesel uh, for, for instance, uh, tourism activities or um, benzene or gasoline for your um, two wheelers or uh, your, your fishing boats. Uh, and it's, uh, it's preventing also to import more uh, fuel from, 
uh, overseas or from uh, far away. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty much a way to create value locally because for for products you can what you can face is uh, a very quickly saturated market. So let's say you want to uh, make construction materials uh, in the Maldives. Uh, I don't. I mean, maybe for for resorts, uh, there's a there's a way to to engage and, and build uh, materials to to make uh, the ponting or something. Uh, but apart from that, it may be quickly saturated or the volumes that you have don't really match, uh, like off takers, uh, demand. Um, so that's, that's pretty much what you need to figure out when you build your, your business model It's like, it's not going to be off after six months because basically you, yeah, you saturated completely the market. Um, it is supposed to be a short to middle term solutions because ideally, uh, you, you don't want to. <laughs> To have to need this uh, in the first place, so, because these plastics are like basically the single use and the ones that you may find an alternative for. Um, and yeah, and by the way, uh, when you yeah, when we build the system, for instance, in um, in Indonesia with uh, with our projects, uh, we have this upstream approach at the same time, which is to uh, educate also in the first place to smoothly find alternative uh, to to those materials, uh, at least for this. Uh, uh, easy to replace single use, uh, and at the same time, you prevent more plastics to enter the ocean by also giving uh, value to it uh, and finding uh, yeah a way to have, uh, for example, waste collection by boat, which is the most appropriate in these areas. Uh, so we've been uh, discussing with a lot of projects that also um, introduce these kind of systems. Uh, there's an example in Banda Islands, which was uh, introduced by a, a German entrepreneur. Uh, in Lombok, also in um, in Indonesia, a project on uh, pyrolysis, uh, also collecting these uh, very hard to recycle plastics. Uh, so the multi layers, uh, even flip flops or things like that, that you can easily find as well, uh, even for cleanups. And um, yeah, it's kind of a hybrid system that you can find. Uh, we try to integrate plastic credits as well because for part of it we still have residue, so you need to find a way to offset it as well, not to release it or not buy it to um, uh, to, to villagers. Uh, and with this, you can you can actually make something viable uh, from a yeah, economic point of view. Uh, otherwise, we, we just don't want to engage with this because it's going to be this kind of project that, are, you know, you have a, a big player coming in, paying for the capex, and then after two years, mm -hmm. it's just dismantled and uh, nothing is done with this. Uh, we have seen this too many times. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of the approach to be like, uh, you know, entrepreneur driven and community driven yeah. uh, so that people there, they see a value from it. They own the thing. They, they own the system. Uh, yeah, yeah, they co-created it. Otherwise, they will just yeah, see it like a, like a, a solution that would just uh, ship there from away and uh, they won't really see the point for their own uh, activity. So yeah, so that's uh, kind of the way we try to engage with uh, this kind of solution, introducing it, uh, really trying to be cautious, not to uh, make it feel like it's fixing everything and you can keep like, you know, consuming as much. And it's, uh, yeah, it's perfect. We find a way to replace it. Uh, so we need to be cautious about that. But at the same time, it's kind of a way to yeah, prevent more uh, yeah, plastic from entering the ocean. Uh, in the short to yeah. middle term, and I think I, I think this is exactly the the, the problem that we are operating in. Right, it's like we are in kind of a transformation from this take, make, whatever. It's not even disposed, but really whatever. It's like yeah. burn, <laughs> do whatever you want with the waste to something a bit more managed to ideally a circular economy. And one thing, or I mean, this is also what we what we are all about is that we believe that plastic credits are a great way to make waste management projects viable in the long run by paying for the operations of it, by making sure that the responsibility is passed on to the right people in the ecosystem. Um, and at the same time, there are also critic voices around it, right? And uh, there, there is massive opportunity to use plastic credit as, as a greenwashing um, to say, like, yeah, we do whatever. And at the same time, I don't see a single customer of ours saying like, okay, I'm, I'm happy to spend that money to just continue business as usual. Um, so it is a lot about um, how to design that system. And when um, 
what what I would like to understand, maybe also from you, Alpha, is where do you think are risks that plastic credits can be used as greenwashing, or what can we do to prevent that this is just going to become a bottomless pit for for greenwashing activities by brands? Um, I think it comes down to having accountability in the end, like because uh, with all these kind of projects, usually we find that you know like um, like a big company would want to sort of um, do sort of use use plastic as a marketing tool because people are conscious of their plastic footprint and then they 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 want to show you that they can somehow offset these plastics by buying another product made out of plastic which could be uh, collected from the ocean could, could be collected from the land i mean could have could have had a positive impact but i mean how are we really able to assess and understand or like you know check for ourselves whether it actually had a positive impact in terms of the the marketing that they were actually selling us to try and sell their product so these are the kind of things that i think we need to be aware of and also like as a consumer we also need to be smart consumers and we we should try and learn these greenwashing techniques and then try and see through it and obviously like the best way to reduce waste is really not to buy these uh, products so like i think reducing our consumption is a key step that we can take and um, for big brands to sort of um, I mean, we, we do have to do our part in also trying to keep those big brands accountable and also try and get them to uh, live up to their sort of marketing, these uh, standards that they're putting out, saying if their uh, products are made out of 50% uh, recycled plastic taken out of the ocean, then we should make sure that it is actually 50% and like, and we should push them to do it even further, take it to the next level and say it's 100% recycled plastic, you know? I think those kind of things are what we could do and what we should be doing. Mm. And yeah, if maybe to, sorry, yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, no, I wanted to quick, uh, quickly jump in uh, um, for a, uh, an experience that I had, but yeah, I'm not an expert in this, but um, when, I mean, for plastic credit exchange, when uh, selling those credits, few of them uh, were also uh, trying to have a chart with the uh, defining a bit some uh, some targets for those company buying the plastic to say okay by the end of the year or by this time I also need to reach this target of reduction of my own uh, plastic consumptions. I think that would be a good way to say okay you're uh, entitled to purchase that much like in the meantime let's say and you uh, you have to reduce by this much if you want to kind of keep in the loop of uh, uh, doing this and it's kind of a you know uh, incentive for those companies as well to to achieve their uh, target of reduction as as well as they contribute um already to uh, help uh, offsetting those plastics and in, in, in those locations uh i've not like seen with my own eyes like this thing's going on because obviously those plastic credit change they're pretty much like uh it's just an ethical thing you, you do it or not there's no one to judge you if you're just a middleman and uh, independent. And with the definition of plastic credits, there's been a bit of debate also on like, uh, yeah, as Afram uh, pointed out, like, uh, is it something that was uh, taken from the sea or from land, et cetera? So there are a lot of standards and way to certify it. But yeah, it's still a bit uh, of things to, yeah, it takes a bit more time maybe to have something even more, uh, is a structured around that? Um, I mean, there's, my experience. No, uh, that makes sense. Okay, um, we're getting closer to the end of the session and um, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, mostly greetings, hello back from Germany uh, to Kenya, to India, uh, to Sri Lanka and um, Uganda as well. Wow, international crowd here. There's uh, one one question uh, from um, from Uganda actually about the quantities of waste that we see in the Maldives on a monthly basis. I think it's not very really defined of what waste we're talking about, but maybe just municipal solid waste. If if you have any information on that. Um, um, 
in in terms of the waste generation in the Maldives, uh, there there have been some gen, uh, studies done, and uh, in terms of generation, I think the number sits at about 700 tons per day. In terms of total generation, this would include uh, construction and demolition waste, food waste, uh, green waste, uh, uh, packaging waste. Uh, medical waste so pretty much everything amounts to about 700 ton uh, 700 tons per day and of that about um 10 percent you could say is plastic and packaging waste and um about five percent would be glass and the the major composition really is food waste as as is in most southeast asian countries like like food waste or wet waste rather uh takes makes up the huge uh, portion of the waste generation in in, in the in the country yeah, it's estimated that uh, um, some recent studies that say that around 20 and 30,000 tons of plastics across all types of plastic are um, generated in, um, in the Maldives. So just to give you a little benchmark. Yeah. All right. Then we have a question from, um, I hope I pronounced the name correctly, what I mean, um, about a, um, a blueprint for uh, small island develop, developing states um, is that known to the crowd? That's the question. In case not, maybe uh, I, I mean it. you can share. Ah, the, the the link is shared. I think. Uh, all right, then we can look at it. Um, yeah, then. Adriana asked the question, how to avoid the rebound effect of reducing and recycling plastic on other materials? Example, given the increased consumption of paper and glass. I think that's, uh, these are all <laughs> very challenging questions and uh, it, it just shows how complex the, the overall topic is, right? But uh, I'd be happy to, to hear your opinion on it. Um, I think in the Maldives also we, we are sort of seeing this shift because uh, we have some policy interventions uh, in place uh, uh, starting from 2019 where we are trying to ban uh, production of single-use plastic in the Maldives. So like uh, bottled water, uh, bo bottled soft drinks, these, these things are coming into a ban and uh, some will fall into an EPR but most of them, like the smaller sizes, will get banned anyway. But uh, as, as a replacement, as an alternative, um, the market is sort of shifting towards uh, glass and aluminium, and um, we are not sure how that will, you know, play out in the long run. Like, I mean, obviously, glass is in a returnable format, so that is in a way good. But then again, there is also the logistics of returning it, so there is also this give and take when it comes to that. But a, a very specific example that just came to mind is that we also are banning styrofoam uh, takeaway containers, and in response to this. Uh, we expected to see sort of paper packaging, compostable packaging, because that is the what makes sense for the country. But then we are seeing more of these aluminium trays being imported into the country as the solution for like takeaway containers. And there is no way to deal with this aluminium waste. So like now we are going to have like contaminated aluminium uh, packaging that you know sometimes is folded up and. I really don't understand how we are going to deal with this uh, waste, new waste stream that's going to come in because obviously takeaway containers is going to generate quite a bit of uh, waste as well. So yeah, these are sort of these challenges that we have. And then I think we have to be nimble in how, uh, you know, like we implement these policy uh, interventions to sort of avoid plastic, but then the repercussions or the, the changes that come about, we also need to be uh nimble to sort of try and address those the issues that might arise from those changes as well mm -hmm. um then we have a comment uh, first of all thanks a lot for, for providing the info and i think it is super interesting to see what um what effects um legislation can have right and it's it's so difficult to to do the right thing to some degree um and we, we also have one comment, the term ocean bound should be banned. Do you agree? Maybe I quickly take that. I do not think that it should be banned. I think it should be very well defined, which I think you do. Um, the term is so tied with greenwashing 50 kilometers from any water course, leave ocean bound open to abuse as we see so many examples of. Um, in fact, I think 
the the beauty of the term ocean bound is that it gives focus on certain regions where we should probably focus first if we want to avoid ocean plastic itself because mismanaged plastic waste mismanaged municipal solid waste in coastal regions is at the highest risk of entering the ocean and these are the areas where we need to focus if we want to avoid um, plastic entering the ocean. This is at least my perspective on it. And I think if we can all agree on a, on a given definition of ocean bound, this is not a horrible thing. What I personally also think is that ocean bound is better than, than ocean plastic, because if you say I'm producing products made out of plastic that come out of the ocean, in the end, what you're doing is you're also giving a certain incentive to put plastic there in the first place. So there's a lot of considerations, I think, that, that need to be taken in the, in the background. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to give their opinion on, on the comment else. Oh, there's a lot of questions coming in, which is exciting. Um, but we are slowly running out of time. Um, um, yeah, we have the, the question from Dan. What about the increase in carbon footprint when it comes to banning plastics in favor for much heavier options? Um, again, that's a good question. Point, I can say, yeah. I think as a, a, a waste engineer, I don't demonize pl plastic 100%. I mean, that I demonize the, um, the not proper wa waste management of plastic when it becomes weight, waste. So we see that, for example, in the Maldives, when a plastic PT bottles are properly bailed and shipped, are way lighter and takes way less space than uh, glass bottles, for example. And when we put everything on the balance in terms of CO2 emissions, so plastic is still a good solution, but uh, the way that in many countries manage is not the solution. And that's why the EPR plastic credit should enter into discussion, I think, and to be part of the solution, especially in order to create that demand of that product. So if someone buys you material, for example, PT bottles at a good price, no one would put them in the ocean. So there would be an interest in collecting them. But the, the lack of these steps along the value chain is making uh, yeah, plastic really a problem in the many countries of the world. And, uh, and going into substitution, for example, with other material like glass that's way heavier or aluminum that for the production has incredibly high um, emission cost. So this is something that we, put, we need to put to the balance. I agree on that point. Um, and then just since we are slowly running out of time, um, last question. Is there any education campaign taking place aside to encourage not only locals but tourists on the importance of segregation reduction and recycling? I think this uh, is a question for both JB and um, Alpha. So we're talking about the Maldives here? Um, uh, I think I both think Maldives, general... but it also applies to, to beautiful places like Flores, right? Which is a tourist location. Even though probably tourism has been low in the past years. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, with the the concept that we have, so it's uh, it's just our case. But um, yeah, the concept is to also encourage more sustainable tourism, breaking with uh, these uh, mass tourism with like zero waste schemes. So basically, is to uh, going more through uh, like small communities and villages and consume only fresh foods from those uh, local areas and not just do a 7-Eleven marathon where you just uh, consume as much as possible. Um, so there is a, a, a huge uh, incentive to, uh, to encourage uh, locals and also, yeah, the communities that are, uh, are visited and that engage through also uh, the programs. So I mentioned a bit earlier when we, we, we work on those uh, waste management schemes in those touristic places, um, we also um, try to uh, suggest and work with uh, communities and do workshops to introduce uh, craftsmanship to make, for instance, uh, products, I mean, locally made with like uh, natural products, let's say for bags, etc. instead of uh, making some also cheap upcycling, like we can usually see, and that would just end up being waste again. Um, so these kind of practices can also yeah, inspire um, consumers that will maybe go back to uh, their country and see things a bit differently and have kind of a 
cultural uh, input from there as well. Mm. Yeah, this might take on education. Uh, education yeah, topics so in the Maldives, sure. there, there is a lot of education campaigns happening. Uh, and uh, this is, I mean, the government as well as other uh, NGOs such as Parley have taken a lot of initiatives in uh, trying to get uh, education on, on especially plastic and waste management into the school system and uh, getting kids to actually learn about their the reefs and the environment around them so that they also understand the need to, and why we should actually protect them because even though we are in the Maldives a lot of these kids have not seen that the reefs that they're surrounded by and the and the marine life that they you know they're living so close to so they've they've taken these steps and I I believe um, I think I, I'm not sure of the exact stat, but I think most of the kids have actually gone and snorkeled. So they have actually seen the reefs now. So like they, they know what, you know, they, they are aiming to save in the future. So they, they understand the need for segregation, reduction, and recycling, these kind of activities. So uh, I, I, I have hope for, that the future generations will actually do much better than we have and actually keep us to account to say, to, uh, yeah. to get get these things done in in the right way and i think there is a there is a very positive note to to almost end on and one that i can second we organized the theater workshop in kerala india with kids out of the community around the topic of plastic and how it relates to the ocean and um the very surprising effect was they they basically went back home and uh while we had issues in that specific village to to run segregated uh, waste collection a few weeks after um, segregation suddenly worked in the household because kids are the agent for change and if they bring that back into the household and tell their parents the, the kind of future they want to see um, I think that is, that is something extremely powerful and that we can learn a lot from and another positive note that we received from, from Sri Lanka is we ban styrofoam packs and plastic plates cutlery etc products made out of natural materials are gaining popularity now and again something that I can second I was lucky enough to be in Sri Lanka in December and uh, I got a very delicious Sri Lankan pancake wrapped in a palm leaf um, which is a great packaging material so maybe going back to the basics sometimes is also the right thing and um, yeah, I hope. There was an interesting session for everyone. If you have questions, um, you can find uh, JB, Paolo, and Afra all on LinkedIn. Uh, I bet they're open for, for any further questions. Maybe we can do a second round um, in the future. But thanks a lot for your time and for participating today. Thank you, Joe, for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks, thanks, everyone. For having us. Yeah, great discussion. Yeah, it was a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.